Hello and welcome to video 14 uh, in my series of uh, short introductions to the ideas of Marx and Marxism. In this one I want to talk about Marx's concept or vision of socialism. Um, people new to Marx often expect that he would have laid out a plan or set of instructions for what socialism should look like and when they find out that he did no such thing um, they, uh, they are often disappointed and think this was rather remiss of him. Uh, now, in fact, for Marx, uh, setting out such a plan uh, would have been quite contrary to his whole theoretical method. For Marx, socialism or communism was something that would emerge out of capitalism uh, uh, as a, um, a result of the struggle of the working class in a historical process uh, whose exact circumstances and details could not possibly be known in advance. Precisely how housing or food distribution, for example, would be organised in the socialist future would be decided not by him or any other Marxist theorist, uh, but by the people of the future themselves. All that was possible, therefore, was to make some broad generalisations about what the nature of the working class and its struggle would oblige it to do and would follow from, um, from that nature, from as it were its social being. Uh, to repeat, for Marx, a socialist society was not something dreamt up in his mind or anyone else's mind. It, it was what the working class would create and would be obliged to create as part of the logic of its own struggle uh, with the bourgeoisie and with capitalism. Uh, therefore, the first step in the direction of socialism uh, for Marx is the working class taking political power, what Marx called the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, of course, this is a term that needs some explanation, especially because of the dictatorship of Stalin and so on, and the, the, the way it sounds today. Um, what Marx meant by the dictatorship of the proletariat was not um, autocratic power for one person, or, or even for some committee, or central committee, but the collective power of the working class, able to enforce its will, the will of the majority, on society by revolutionary means particularly against the resistance of the capitalists. Moreover, the experience of the Paris Commune, which um, Engels had said was an example of the dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, showed that workers' power would be highly democratic, uh, with all people's representatives being elected and subject to recall and paid the average worker's wage. It would, in fact, be more democratic than ordinary capitalist democracy. The next step would be for the working class to take over the main uh, industries, services, banks, and so on. Not every corner shop, but the core, the central institutions uh, of the economy, and to take them into public ownership, i.e. state ownership with, of course, the understanding that the state is now not the capitalist state we're so familiar with, but the working class organised as the ruling class. The point about this is not the implementation of socialist dogma, you know, for, for state ownership versus private ownership uh, and so on, but that it is only through collective state ownership that the working class can possibly take control of the economy. Uh, they can't do it by dividing up the banks or the major industries between individuals, sharing them out. You know, we'll, we'll take over General Motors and give a bit of it to each of the car workers. You can't do that. Um, it can only be done collectively. But if that is established and brought under democratic planning by the, under the control of democratic planning by the working class, it would mean that instead of... Um, Living, instead of dead labour, i.e. capital dominating living labour, as has happened hitherto, that living labour will, for the first time, dominate dead labour. Production for profit uh, and the anarchy of the capitalist market will be replaced by planned production for human need. 
But this is uh, just the first phase uh, of a historical process leading to full socialism and communism. In this first phase, society will be marked in many ways by the capitalism from which it has uh, uh, just emerged. People will be paid, uh, says Marx, in the main according to the work they do, which, as he acknowledges, is still a form of inequality because people are not the same, people have different needs, and there will still be money, still a state, and still class conflict because the bourgeoisie will not just simply go away, it will still be struggling um, in one way or another to try and regain the power that it has lost. To go beyond this first stage, to complete the transition to communism, I'm using communism here as kind of synonymous with socialism, to complete the transition to full socialism or full communism, a number of things are necessary. First, workers' power has to spread internationally. Marx and Engels never believed you could create a socialist country uh, or society in just one country. Second, the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, must be defeated not only politically and militarily, but also economically and historically. It will be necessary to uproot the underlying social structures that make it possible for the bourgeoisie to reproduce itself and make a comeback. Thirdly, it will be necessary to raise the level of production globally, the standard of living of people globally, to the point where there can be a decent life for all and all will be involved in cooperatively managing the wealth and life of society. If there's just generalised poverty, Marx believed, the, all the old crap, as he called it, all the old rubbish will revive of class inequality and so on. Has to be, there has to be a, a, a level of a decent life for all. Um, what this will mean, Marx believes, uh, is the achievement of a genuinely classless society. Uh, based on the principles of from each according to their ability to each according to their need, in which, because class and class conflict has been overcome, the state will wither away and real free human freedom will have been won. Uh, and which would also, and this is, well, I said this, and it is also particularly important in the present circumstances of the world today, which will also heal the metabolic rift between human society and nature that capitalism has uh, opened up. That's something I'll be discussing later in this, uh, in the, in this series. Uh, Marx also believed that in ending exploitation and class oppression, the working class would be tearing up the roots of all forms of oppression, including the age-old oppression of women. Now, that is a very big subject um, and in its own right, and one which, along with the question of racism and other forms of oppression, I will return to later in this series. Uh, it's worth saying, however, that uh, what this means, the achievement of a socialist society as understood by Marx, what it will mean is a world of peace, and a world in which there are no longer people starving while other people are millionaires, and in which children in their hundreds of thousands or millions uh, have their lives cut short by easily curable diseases or lack of clean water or lack of basic food and so on. It'll be a world without all those things, um, <coughs> which incidentally I think is a world worth fighting for. Now. At this point, I'm going to shift the focus uh, of the, these videos somewhat and switch from just explaining the ideas of Marx to discussing some of the developments of, uh, um, in Marxism after Marx's death. We must never lose sight of the fact um, that Marxism is not a set of sacred texts um, handed down from the great man, but a method and a guide to action and a living theory which must be continually developed and renewed to take account of developments in the changing world. And it has, Marxism has been developed by a whole number of different people and in many different circumstances, and I'll be looking at some of the most important developments 
in Marxism after Marx from here on. Thank you.